Welcome to the weekly sermon podcast for the Wilmington, Ohio Church of Christ. We pray that this message will inspire you and help you grow closer to God in your faith. Be sure to stick around after the message to find out more about how you can take your next best step. Enjoy the message. Good morning. My name's Bruce Stoffer, and I'm here first before I even get started in my sermon to give you one word of of admonition. And that is when you get home today, take a look at James chapter 1, where it says, be careful not to speak quickly. And the reason I say that is about six weeks ago, Dale reached out to me and texted me and said, would you like to preach? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to. And then he wrote, great, because we're starting a new series on faith and politics. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate the ordering of that, those questions and information. Oh, of all the things in the world to talk about, faith and politics, I even made certain that he knew. I said, are you sure that you want me to speak? And he said, I've seen your Facebook posts, Bruce. You go ahead and preach. Well, that was how it all started. Then he sent me the information on the series, and I looked at the sermon for this week, and I went, wow, I just really am not certain I can preach that sermon. And I reached back out to Dale and said, dude, are you sure? And he said, just preach God's word, because I want you to preach what the congregation needs to hear. Oh, great. That's a little more pressure. (sighs) So then I had to stop and think, okay, what does God want me to preach on? I mean, there are so many topics, climate, environment, political corruption, drugs and crime, cybersecurity, guns and gun control, renewable energy. You know, the Bible speaks to almost every one of those topics. But then I really looked at the the title again, Faith and Politics, and I realize what I need to speak on. And boy, I did not want to preach on it. Faith and Politics. Put my political shirt on. And I decided, okay, if we're going to bite the apple, we might as well swallow it whole. We're going to look today at whether or not God supports the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. Nick asked me yesterday, is there anything I needed? And I said, yeah, could you put a bulletproof screen up here? (laughs) One person said, you'll be able to hear the bullets going into the chambers getting ready. What am I doing? And yet... One of the passages that Dale sent to me spoke to this subject so perfectly that I could not ignore it. It's something that we need to address within the church before the political season gets really fully underway. Does God support the Democrat Party? Or does he support the Republican Party? And maybe even, does he even support America? These are issues that Christians should be working with. And the best way to know whether or not the answer to any of those questions is to look, first of all, did he ever support any nation? And of course, the nation that would come to mind would be Israel. And before we get into the sermon text, we have to understand the history of Israel. God called Abraham and said, I'm going to bless all nations through you. And I'm going to bless you as an, and your descendants as a nation, and through you all other nations will be blessed. Sounds like God's for Israel. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had several sons, one of which was Joseph, who got sold away into slavery. He went down into Egypt. A great famine arose. All of Israel moved. Israel's descendants, all of Abraham's descendants, moved down into Egypt, and there they spent the next 430 years. 
That's longer than the United States has been around. They went from being two or three hundred people to three million in that 430 years of time. They have become a force to be reckoned with within Egypt. And Pharaoh doesn't want to let them go. But God raises up a man named Moses. God gives to Moses plagues to convince Pharaoh. Moses, at God's command, leads the people out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and God destroys the Egyptian army that's following them. Are you starting to see that God supports Israel? It's not just till here. The people start to go into the promised land and <laughs> they screw up. They're a lot like you and me. We can see all the evidence that God is all around us. But there are a lot of times we still fail to follow God. When God said go into the promised land, they balked. They said, no, we kind of like it here. God said, fine, you'll stay there and you'll die there. Forty more years of wandering in the wilderness. Moses got to see into the promised land from the top of a hill. There are people out there. Wow, I can see you all. He got to see into the promised land, but he did not get to go. Another man was chosen to lead them. Joseph, or Joshua, the son of Nun, who was one of the two spies who'd said, yes, we can go into the promised land, was the man God chose. Hmm. Now, you would think that Joshua, at this point in time, knows fully well what God wants. And God does. God communicates to him and tells him, here's how to line the people up. Here's how we're going to get across into the promised land. Because between Joshua and the promised land, there's a river called the Jordan River. And they have to cross it. Three million people crossing one river. God tells them to pick up a, the Ark of the Covenant, step into the water, and watch it stop. And it does. And three million people cross over in one day into the promised land. Now that sounds like an awesome feat. And I would have loved to have seen it. But can you imagine what happened 30 minutes later? 30 minutes after the last person stepped across, there was a river running behind them and the enemy standing in front of them. This was a nation of people, three million strong, that didn't have an army, didn't have many weapons, didn't have any siege engines, looking at a fortified city set up on a hill with walls so thick that they could run chariots around the top of it. And God said, there you go. And that brings us to the text today. It's a, a, just three verses that I've often skimmed over. But Joshua is in this situation. And it's interesting to see what God's position is concerning Israel. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13, 14, and 15 is our sermon text for the day. And Joshua chapter 5 tells us this. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. If there has ever been a nation that could have bragged that God was for them, it was Israel at that time. 
God had created them through Abraham. He had blessed them through all the descendants. He had made them into a three million strong nation. And yet, when Joshua asked, are you for us or against us? The commander of God's own men said, neither. So if you thought I was going to pick a side this morning between Democrat and Republican, I have. God has not. Is God a Republican or a Democrat? He's neither. He's God. He wants us to follow him. God had established Israel. God had provided for them. God had grown them. God protected them. But when the push came to shove, the truth of the matter becomes, not is God for them, but are they following God? Too many times we, we fall into the same trap. We look at God and we assume that God sees the world as we do. And it's amazing to me how many times we look at the world and see, well, they're different. They're from a different place. They talk different. They have different values. And God goes, but are they following me? I find it interesting that a king in the Old Testament named David wrote this psalm. Psalm number two tells us this. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break down their, their chains and throw off the, his shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, and the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. You see, God doesn't care about nations. He doesn't care about your politics. He cares about whether you're allowing your heart to guide you closer to him. And so many times we think that God... God is worried about what's going on in our political realm. God wasn't pro-Israel. He's not pro-American, much to my dismay. What God really is for is for you and for me to follow him. Our founding fathers really did try to follow God. In fact, the area in which we live in was once called part of the Northwest Territory. And in defining the Northwest Territory and what it was going to take for those, that area that later became Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois, and part of Minnesota, in order for any of those parts to become a state, they wrote in the charter for the Northwest Territory that they had to have educational processes, and religious establishments firmly entrenched. That was the type of government we once had. That was the government that by 1840, the United States Census said that 100% of the United States of America would, one day, would soon, within decades, be Christian. Fast forward to 1945, when we became the superpower of the United States. Fast forward to 1950s, where we said that God no longer needed to be in our classrooms. Fast forward to the 60s and 70s, where we said we need to remove the Ten Commandments and the Bible from our classrooms. Fast forward to today, where we... Enshrine, enshrine sin 
as a right, as a privilege, and as a crime to discriminate against. Do you want to know why things have changed in the last 50 years? I can tell you. 50 years ago, my family went on its first vacation. I grew up in Sabina, just down the road. And I can remember having to go up to Holmes Hardware in Sabina and get a lock set for the front door. The reason was real plain. In the 20 years that we'd lived in that house, we had never once locked the doors to the house. And yet in 1974, we had to lock the doors for the first time. Think about what it's like now. How many of you even get out of your car without locking the doors? The world has changed. The world in which we live is completely different. I used to see friends. Now we're supposed to see race. We're, I used to see all sorts of things that were good. Now we're just pointing to evil. Drugs were the scourge of the city, but now we see them on our own streets. My family was stunned when we heard the Watergate tapes and we heard a president of the United States for the first time cursing and swearing. And we wonder why 50 years later we're in the mess we're in. You see, God's not worried about which party. He's worried about whether our hearts are pursuing him. God has a message for us today. He's holy. And he expects you and me to be holy. Now, too many times we have the, the telescope of perspective turned around backwards too many times we like to look at God through the big end and out the small end. And we go, why is God walking so far away from us? Why is he so very far away when in fact he is right there? All he is waiting for is for us to look at him properly and see that it's not right for us to ask God to bless our plans we are supposed to be seeking to do God's plans with our hearts. The perspective is all whopper-jawed in our culture today. We, we ask God to, to bless what we've worked on for weeks instead of doing what God has planned out for years and centuries. We have to follow God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God is holy. And we need to pursue him. We need to recognize that he is king of kings and lord of lords, not us. Too many times we look at God and we go, would you be our lucky rabbit's foot? I'd like you to bless me. Bless the ways that I walk instead of bless the ways that he has laid out for me to walk. That was my problem this last few weeks. I've wanted to go my way. To be honest, I wanted to call up Dale and said, ah, rain check. And instead, God said, no, you need to preach. Because we all have to understand we should be thankful for men like Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, because they showed us how failed politics really is. We should be thankful for the presidents that we've had that we probably haven't prayed for, because they have shown us over and over again that relying upon this world to save us, to make things better, is a plan that is based on folly. 
the only way to salvation, the only way to safety, the only way is to follow God wholeheartedly, and he is holy. So when it comes to our politics, we too, like Joshua, have to stand on holy ground. I always laugh when Dow gets up here to preach because he takes off his shoes and he takes off his socks because he, he recognizes that preaching is a holy thing. I laugh because I know that I'm standing in front of God right now, but I was standing in front of God when I was back in the back room. I was standing in front of God this morning when I got out of bed, and I'm standing in front of God on Friday night when I was at the restaurant. You see, everywhere we go as Christians, we are standing in the presence of God. And while taking off shoes is a wonderful symbol of realizing you're in the presence of God, the reality is we always are in the presence of God. The reality is God is there looking at you and me and wanting us to be like him, to pursue him, to want him with all of our heart and all of who we are. We have to stand together on holy ground. And I'll tell you what, there isn't much holy ground to go around. In fact, there's only a little bit of it. It's called the word of God. You can stand on your political bias. You can stand on your history. You can stand on what your mama and daddy voted. Or you can stand on what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary. The political process of a nation cannot be allowed to divide a church. We can't allow it. This... When, when Dale first told me that we were doing this in March, I thought, wow, that's a weird time of year to do this. And yet I think it was a wise choice. Because before everybody gets all spun up, before we all get to dividing sides and pointing fingers and yelling at one another, we have an opportunity to realize what's really important. And that is to be unified as a body of Christ first. Political parties aside, this is what is important. We cannot be dividing, we cannot be accusing one another about things that do not matter. Do you realize that most of what people are going to argue about in this election won't even make it into the history books in 50 years? Nobody really, it's really not that important. What is important is are we going to stay together as a body? Are we going to love one another and be examples to the world? And are we going to choose together to stand with Jesus Christ? We all have to agree that the cause of Christ has to be our focus. And our candidate, our party, and even our nation has to become secondary in, its, in our priority. The holy ground upon which we have to stand and even die upon is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and we have to accept him as our Lord and Savior. We get to accept him as our Lord and Savior. I loved watching Jenner's film again because he's a, a beautiful example of what life is. Prior to knowing Jesus Christ, he said it was worthless. He was ready to chuck it all. And then with Christ, he has reason. A reason to celebrate, to live, to love, to reach others. Folks, today, please don't stand on politics. Please don't stand on your candidate. Please stand with Jesus Christ. Please join him. We do not dare allow political factions to, to divide us, not when we have one body to join. If you've never been a part of his, his body, then today we extend to you an opportunity. 
to be born again, to become a part of his body. Seek me out, seek Dale out, seek out one of the other ministers or, or elders that are here today and ask them, what, the, what must I do to become a part of the body of Christ? What must I do to be a Christian? Because the fact of the matter is, the Democrats aren't going to save you and neither are the Republicans. And neither is the fact that you're an American. Jesus Christ is the only one who takes us into heaven. And there's really only one way in, and that's through him, through his death, burial, and resurrection, as symbolized in baptism. And we'd love to talk to you about that. But to those of you who have already become Christians, I have a couple things to admonish you. Number one, don't vote straight down the R's. Don't vote straight down the D's. Look at the people. And ask yourself, will these men or women help me walk closer to God? Or will they take away my freedom to walk closer to God? I want you to think about that this this political season. But I also want you to think more along. What does it take for me to be holy before God? What it takes is for us to accept Jesus Christ as our our Savior, yes. But more importantly, our Lord. To submit to him in the crazy ways that he has laid out for us. You see, when Joshua did go to attack Jericho, it wasn't with might and power. It was marching around the city seven times. And God brought down the the walls. The ways that God has chosen for us to live our lives may not always make sense to us. But he asks us to walk in faith with him. If you didn't pick up a communion packet this morning... They're at the back door, and this is the time where we're going to be partaking of them. And this really doesn't make sense either. I know it's grape juice, and I know it's a styrofoam-like piece of bread. We all know that it's not really blood or bone. And yet it is that God has looked at us and said to remember the sacrifice of his son Jesus by partaking of the bread and the juice whenever we come together. Because this isn't just a wafer. This is to symbolize the very skin, the very flesh that Jesus Christ had torn open for you and for me. This is where we're supposed to take our stand. Is with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, our Savior and our Lord. By partaking of this, we renew our vows to Him to be obedient and to walk with Him you partake this morning. Some of you know that over the past year I've developed AFib. And on January 4th, I successfully had a surgery to reverse that. The most frustrating part of having AFib has been the medication I've been on. It's made me unable to give blood. You see, I've given 59 units of blood in my life. I'd really like to get 60th. 
because that means somebody else gets a life, a chance at life. I understand what blood means. It's the very life that somebody else needs. I think Jesus Christ understood that even more when he said to do this in remembrance of him, to partake of the fruit of the vine, remembering the sacrifice he gave for every one of us to have life and life eternal. This morning, won't you remember his life, his sacrifice with me? This morning, I'm going to finish this heavy sermon up. Gee, me. I haven't heard you all take a breath in like 15 minutes. Take a breath. Understand this. God is not a Republican. God is not a Democrat. He loves you. Enough to give his only begotten son for you. The best thing what we can do to show him our love back is to depart from here and live like him. We hope you have enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, talk to, or maybe you just want more information about our church, be sure to fill out a Connect card so we can reach out and help you take your next best step. Thanks again for joining, and we will see you back here next time.